My name is Danny Ortega, and I work for the Ortega Law Firm. I've been a lawyer in this town for over 40 years. I practice primarily in the area of personal injury. You know, you've heard the commercials over to me by the lawyers who tell you that they do auto accident work. Well, I do a lot of work involving auto accidents, as well as medical malpractice. If you feel that a doctor, a hospital, or a medical provider has somehow not given you the proper medical treatment and that has injured you or if you lost a loved one as a result of a malpractice we do that work too we also do cases like dog bites slip and falls things of that nature where you've been injured because of the negligence of another that is the kind of work that we do Hello and welcome. I'm Jesus Hernandez. This is Arizona Barrio Stories, where we celebrate our culture, our tradition, and embrace our achievements. Today we have a special guest, uh, Silvana Salcido Esparza. She is the owner of Barrio Cafe. Buenos dias. Gracias for joining us. It's a pleasure. It's mío. Thank you for having me. Savannah, so, tell me a little bit about uh, uh, your history is, is intriguing as what I've uh, done my research in a way. As a journalist, you have to do a little bit of research. But tell me a little bit about the place where you were born and how that had an impact on your life in terms of uh, your views and your positive uh, uh, views of life. Tell me about that. Well, I was born in San Fernando. I'm an original valley girl. You know, they say valley girl, right? They think of Californians. Mm -hmm. But that had nothing to do with anything. I was destined to be a, a city girl. Okay. But my, my father, who was a baker and a son of a baker, um, got wind of a little farming town that needed a bakery. So they sold the house, took the equity. First of all, it was a miracle that they, they had been in this country for five years and they already owned a house. Mm -hmm. They took the equity and opened up a bakery in Merced, California, the valley. What was the name of the bakery? Panadilla La Azteca. Okay. In fact, uh, it's a, the third owner is still there with the recipes of my father. I was just there last week enjoying it. It's now Panadilla Guadalajara. But that's where I grew up in Merced, California. Merced. It's a farming community, everybody around there uh, has some kind of farming connection. What did that teach you? What being in that farming barrio, I guess you would call it? Oh my goodness, it was a, uh, it, it taught me so many things. Let me tell you a little story. My father was not only the, the, the local baker, El Panadero, because mm -hmm. there was bakers too, they, they made cakes, nosotros made quequis, y, y pan, pan, but he was also the preacher. He was a testigo of Jehovah, and he was the one that, that uh, when we got there in 66, there was no Spanish-speaking congregation. So he went out and found enough people to start a Spanish-speaking congregation. So he was much loved and known in the community. So he was embedded in the community. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I had the experience of, on a Saturday morning, going out to the Campitos. Mm -hmm. Uh, and knocking on their doors and, and being invited in and, and listening to the adults preach as I sat there and looked and took in um, desde los agujeros en la pared to the smell of the, the olla de frijoles y las tortillas quemadas and, and the, the kids and that feel of, of poverty as well. Yeah, you know, but and, there was a richness of life. But there was a richness in that little wooden shack. Sure. And at the same time, we would come back midweek and sell bread through my dad's van. And I got to witness those same people come out and, and perhaps have no money and try to barter with tomatoes or peaches or whatever they, they had been working in the fields. So, and at the same time as I grew up, those same families would eventually stop being as a migrant Mm -hmm. and set roots in Merced, so I got to see that as well. So when it comes down to Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, El Valle San Joaquin, I'm rich embedded in that. By, uh, in fact, when I met Dolores Huerta, she said, you're an Esparza? You know mm -hmm. Laureano Esparza from Delano, California? I'm like, yeah, it's my uncle. She goes, you know in that bakery 
So she, she goes, Richard, Richard mm -hmm. Chavez, right, mm -hmm. says our mm -hmm. brother. She goes, Richard, mira, she's related to Larry. <laughs> and, and she goes, well, Richard built the construction on your uncle's bakery in Delano. You probably have some, um, some views on what's happening now with the, with the farm workers and the COVID. Because you talk about Cesar Chavez and you talked about Dolora, Dolores Fuerta, you, you, there, there is that situation now with the COVID and those farm workers. Well, you know, ¿Qué, ¿Qué sientes cuando oyes lo que le está pasando a ellos? What's happening to them? Es que no es la, no la primera vez, ni la última vez. Silvana, tell me a little bit about the fact that you are considered an award-winning chef. Okay? You came here to Phoenix some years ago and... I read where you came to Phoenix and it helped heal you. Tie those two together. How did that all take place? You came to this city and you got healed from what? Well, the city for some reason is called Phoenix. You know, we ascend from the ashes, that right. bird. And I came here very, very wounded. My mother had um, at age 56, been told she had three months to live from lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And I relate that to growing up in the San Joaquin Valley, environmental. Right. Um, so I took care of her for a, a good solid year. And once we, we closed down her, her estate and the sale of the bakery and everything, I was just very raw. Mm -hmm. And so I picked up where I, I had left off and that was moving here to go to school. But unlike the first time I was supposed to move here and go to school, I was just coming to school. Right. This time I had a... a, a the culinary school. Yes, culinary school. But this time I had a... I was now middle-aged at 35, 34. I turned 35 years. Si, pues I wish I was 35 <laughs> now. But at that time, I, I, I knew that I wasn't exactly a spring chicken. Mm -hmm. And I got to school and... I was just not angry, but raw. I really, excuse the language, didn't give a shit. Me valía todo, you know. I just wanted to get the little kids in school that, you know, where they're like, I want to be a chef, so they go to school. Right. Like, quítate mocoso. Let me show you how it's done. I, I got an A and a 4.0, and midway through school, I get a full scholarship. Did I enjoy school? I was a beast in school. Mm-hmm. But I didn't care. I just wanted to take everything as fast as I could. So Absorb I could just, everything. So I could just go on. And in school, I, I swear my mother was my guardian angel. Because in school, I got a full scholarship midway through. Who gets a full scholarship? Culinary school is very, very expensive. And then you took a trip. Because you wanted to find because, out a baba tu cultura well, that's, y la comida. That's where the healing began, right? Okay. The healing began here in Phoenix. I was given a full scholarship. That's a miracle. Mm -hmm. right? That's a miracle because that afforded me the opportunity to travel where otherwise I would have been paying back a loan. At age 40, I took my 401k. Y me largué a México. Y cuando llegué a México, I found my mother there. You took a bus. I took the bus from... Right here on 7th Street, mm -hmm. I took the... A Greyhound, huh? Well, no, I, no, not the Greyhound. <laughs> I don't travel Greyhound. I travel La Mexicana. Okay. I took the limousina to Juarez. Uh -huh. From Juarez, I, I just ventured strictly on the bus. And that's where I found my mother, my grandmother, your mother, mm -hmm. las tías, las señoras. And I, I, was, I was supposed to study, uh, I had a scholarship to study with a, a famous chef. When I got there... In Mexico City, right? No, in Oaxaca. In Oaxaca? And, but when I got there, I was like, ni para qué. I just grabbed my stuff and threw it back in. Me largo otra vez. So how many recipes did you pick up? I don't think I picked up any recipes. How many did I make up from there? Everything I do. From everything you saw? Yeah. Uh, because you can't pick up a recipe in Mexico. Right. It's not, it's not yeah. no, especially no, back no. then. You pick up a family essence. Right. You pick up generational pride and legacy. Yeah. El mole de mi abuela. El mole de mi mamá. Yeah. You know, and everybody's very secretive. Y lo cuidan. So when they shared with me, I wasn't there to write, write the recipes. I was there to feel the essence de tu mamá y de tu abuela, de tu tía Matilde. You know, the stories behind the moles. Ever since that trip at age 40, and I'm now 60, for the last 20 years, I've done nothing but travel. 
I've been privileged to be able to, uh, been, I'm broke as anything, COVID. I've lost restaurants, I am broke. <laughs> I have no business traveling. Guess what I'm doing? I'm gonna travel. travel. I have my COVID injections and vamonos uh, a Mexico. And what I'm doing is, I'm doing the bus again, la mochilita al hombro. But and, before you get on the bus again, tell us a little bit about, about the restaurant you opened here as a result, Barrio Cafe, and, and uh, did all those recipes come into play into the, the mix of the food that you make? Well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, being a, a growing up in my father's bakery, Knowing that I have 800-year family legacy of gastronomic excellence through bakeries. Uh, I had my first business at age 15, making and selling carnitas inside my father's bakery. At 19, I had a taqueria. I left at 19, came back at 27, guess what I did? A taqueria again. Mm -hmm. And uh, siempre comien, you know, con la comida. So, so when I got here, and I left, I remember being in a, in a beach in Quintana Roo, thinking, hey, I gotta go back to the States, ya se acabó el party. Vámonos, ahora que? I had all this information. And I started like this, I went, New York? Eh, I'm 40, 41 at the time. I was like, nah. Chicago too cold. Uh, Miami, been there, done that. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna go to Miami. California, Day Soy, you know. And I ended up back in Phoenix, because Phoenix called me. I wasn't done healing. I don't think Castillo, 602-253-6223. I'm attorney Richard Castillo. I have been an Arizona trial attorney for over 25 years. If you or your loved one was seriously injured or a death resulted from an automobile, motorcycle or trucking accident, a pedestrian accident, even from a dog bite, call me at 602-253-6223. You may have the grounds for a personal injury or wrongful death claim if it was caused by another person's negligence, recklessness or misconduct. Call 602-253-6223. También hablamos español. Castillo 602-253-6223. I think I would have had the success anywhere else. But here. here. So you feel healed? You know, you never heal from uh, the passing of your mother. You never heal. Right. It changes. Correct. But I use that. One, one thing I've learned is there's no shame in taking a negative and turning it into a positive. And I learned that through her passing. So when my father passed, I took his passing as well. Uh, I had opened up the barrio and a week later my father tragically passes away. So I took that and used it as a force. I, I used what they did, their paths, my ancestors past, and I jump on their shoulders and I jump off of that. And I'm the end of the line. End of the line? I'm the end of the line for, for this family for here. Family? I, I have a family. I have nieces and nephews, but I am the end of the line. Mm -hmm. uh, I never gave birth, but I did ra raise two boys. Esparza, does that relate to Montezuma Esparza at all? Yes, Montezuma Esparza is a distant relative. When I met Montezuma, I said, uh, we're, we're cousins. Wow. And he, why did your father name you Moctezuma? He goes, I don't know, he liked the name. Mm -hmm. I said, no, you're related to Moctezuma. Because the Esparzas are related to Moctezuma. Sure. Whether you like it or not, right. if you're an Esparza in this country, first of all, it's not even a family, it's a family name, it's not. It's the name of a medieval town in the Pyrenees in Spain. Let's shift the conversation here a little bit to, to where we are right now in Phoenix and the barrios. Uh, considering the name of the program, Arizona Barrio Stories, what would you like to uh, pass on to those youngsters coming up in El Barrio and those who see El Barrio as something that is negative, poverty? Uh, what would you tell them? Barrio is your home. Barrio is where your heart's at. You take that and you embrace it. It could be in Scottsdale, right? I don't care where you're from. <laughs> tu barrio is tu corazón. You know, that's where you're from, your little canton, you know? Mm -hmm. and. 
your barrio stories, that, that's, what, that's what feeds you and the next generation. You know, you, you take those stories and you, and, and you run with them. It's like a combination plate. Yes, absolutely a combination <laughs> plate. But you have to run with them. You have to be empowered by them. Mm -hmm. you know, um, there's no shame. There's no shame. That's, that's a success story. When you talk about, you know, cultural divides and, and what has happened and we have to continue fighting so it doesn't happen anymore. So we're empowered. We're empowered by the, the things that happened to your mother, your mother's story. Sure. Right? You're empowered. That's what makes you, you and your, your kids even better than you. And we got to embrace it. We got to embrace it. Don't let them forget. Why would my uncle stop me when I was a kid and tell me little seeds that were Basque, were this, were that? Venimos de 800 años de panadería. Don't forget that. How do we pass it on to the next generation? Um, they used to tell, tell you. They used to tell you stories, you know? So you keep telling those barrio stories, those family stories, those cultural stories. It doesn't stories. happen often, often nowadays with the well, new, gener new generation. Maybe we need to become... With, with, with the social media and stuff. Those, those kind of stories kind of okay. go by the wayside. I'm a little mad at, at this, you know, I look down and everybody, including myself, will be sitting there at, at one point looking down, you know, like all of a sudden everybody's talking and there'll be a lull in the room and everybody, you look down, everybody's like this. And it's so easy for all of us to, to blame that on the new generation or, right. or, or you know, like all they want to do is that. What are you doing when you're doing this? Are you doing pendejadas, excuse the language? Right. No, you're taking in information. So maybe we need to write down our information. <laughs> maybe we don't do it like this. Right. We threw it through here. Right. So using social media to promote our barrio stories and our, and our, our history, our cultura, that's what you're saying. At this, it, the platform is larger. Okay. Yeah. So, so what kind of advice would you give to the new generation in, in, uh, that's growing up, those who might be uh, interested in starting a barrio cafe like yourself, um, about the difficulties they might face, what would you tell them? How would you encourage them? I would say, um, you know, COVID has, has shed light and magnified light on, a, on so many things. And I'm gonna say the same thing I told Joe Biden when he came to my restaurant. How, how, how did you feel about that when he came to your restaurant? I felt like a chingona. Chingona, huh? <laughs> yeah, I felt like a chingona. Huh? Yeah, I was going to talk <laughs> about uh, immigration and gay and this and all those you know, things that affect me, but I ended up talking about being inclusive mm. and not alienating the haters, you know? Um, and then I thanked them for, for taking his belief, his religion, and not using it as a show-off shield, look what I do, but quietly and still bring it to the forefront. And um, because as a daughter of a preacher, do you think I go to church? No. <laughs> of course I'm anti-organized religion, but I have a vast, deep respect for people who are of faith. Because mm -hmm. I'm of faith. Soy creyente. In right. todo, right. en lo tuyo, en lo mío, en todo. And so I thanked him for that out of respect. Then he sat there and told me a little story about a, a bracelet he has. And I know we're off topic, but I think it's important for because it's a, it's, it's a message of hope. Mm -hmm. And he said, do you see this bracelet? I use it as a beacon. He said, my son Bo was wearing it when he died. Oh, okay. Then he had a tear in his eye. Sure. It was, and I use it That's as a special beacon. for someone who's president. Well, he wasn't president then, but right, absolutely right. For, a, for a tear in his eye. Yeah, and, yeah. But he heard the inclusion part, you know, because as much as we want to be included, we have to allow others to accept us too, right? right. We have right. to accept them. So as a person who has not been accepted, just merely by the way I look, the way I think, the way I talk, um, I need to accept everybody before I can expect those to accept me. So that's number one. It's mm -hmm. not to be angry. Right. Right? To look at everything through love because if you're looking to grow in the food industry, which is a hospitality industry, right. 
Which part of hospitable didn't you understand? You have to be hospitable. That means you have to be a person that comes from a place of love. So your words of, in, of encouragement, what would they be in closing off? Is don't give up. Don't let uh, the, the, the stairway that you have to take, perhaps it's located in the back of the building, perhaps it's tiny and temporary, but it still goes up the same place than going in through the grand stair case in the front. If you have to work harder, then work harder. It makes you even more of a chingon. Is there one dish that you say at your restaurant, that you make at your restaurant, that reflects your journey? No, because there, 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 there's some, every dish has a story. E every dish has a reason why it was created or where it came from and an origin. And so not, not one dish could possibly reflect that. reflect that at all. Yeah. But the whole restaurant does collectively reflect the journey, the journey of the San Joaquin Valley and, and those campitos, right. all the way to working with the señoras uh, artesanales in Mexico. And of course, the, 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 my grandmother and her, uh, her she was Tanamara okay. and grew up in an hacienda as, of course, the working class. And so all that hard work and, and hokoki and, and the way they did things, that reflects back in me. Well, I gotta tell you that I'm embarrassed that I haven't been to your restaurant yet, but I will. Well, 19 now. years and, and, and COVID almost killed it. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I have to say, I have to say this. Um, COVID almost totally killed everything that I, I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were number one, and and in the pathway of that hurricane called coronavirus, and it got to the point where. I get a phone call, I'm in Mexico, and I get a phone call from my business partner. She says, we don't have any money. We have like 800 bucks or something left in the bank, which was, I was okay with that. I was like, okay, pues ni modo, hasta aquí llegó. Mm. Pull the plug, let's go. Mm. Let's close this baby down. I got things to do, because you know, I, I got life. And life has come back. Absolutely, and-, yeah. and uh, You're resurrected. Absolutely, I, I just- Que lindo. But I just said to the community, this is it, folks. It's more like cabrona virus. The cabrona virus. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Silvana, gracias por este momento, Thank this you. moment you spent with us sharing your story. It's a, a very intriguing story. I hope that our audience gets uh, inspired by what they've heard today. Uh, and we will probably talk again in the near future. Absolutely. Okay. Next time I'll take you for a, a cruise on my lowrider. Andale, the lowrider. I forgot to ask you about that, but you love those lowriders. Absolutely. We got to be proud of our lowrider community. Andale, and pues. Gracias. I'm Jesus Hernandez, and this is Arizona Barrio Stories. And bienvenidos to the Arizona Latino Arts and Cultural Center, ALAC. My name is Elizabeth Toledo, and I am the executive director, and I would like to give you a little tour. So follow me. This is the main gallery, and in the main gallery, we usually have an ex exhibition going on. At this point, because of COVID, the only exhibition we have, or the artists that we are showing, are our local artists, and we are all resident artists here at a lot. One of the things that I wanted to say about the artwork that we have here before we continue is that every piece in this gallery tells a story. Everything has something to say. There's a reason why it was painted that way. There's a reason, there's a story behind it. If we continue on, we're gonna have, um, this is yours truly work. This is my work and I have my Katrinas, I have the goddess. This part of the gallery, we can also continue with artwork as you can see. We have artwork in front of us over here. This is Pearson, uh, Pearson Doctor. Excellent, excellent um, artist. Some of his things are political. You have here of uh, 
somebody trying to cross the border and they're taking the children away. Um, and then here we have of uh, the women who were missing. There's a lot of children and women that were missing of the Native Americans. So um, we're going to continue on. We have more work. This is a continuation of La Tiendita. We have a gift shop here, but actually the whole gallery, there's stuff for sale. So as we go on, you can see that we have things all over. There's things for the house. There's things for your office. We have for napkins. I mean, there's so many things that we can, that you can buy here. And we also have the artwork. And we're, I'm going to take you now to La Tiendita. La Tiendita means the little store. We have featured um, Kathy Garcia Cha Cha Cheek design. Kathy Garcia is a Phoenix native. And we have your typical Mexican shirts, blouses, dresses for children. So we go on and on. One of the things, we're very proud that one of the things of the Mexican culture, or the Latino culture is that we work with our hands a lot and leather seems to be something that is very popular in this. We have, for example, this purse. This purse is hand carved, as you can see. And this is by uh, Mexican artists. This is from Mexico. And these are beautiful. We have them in yellow. If you could point the camera up there where we have it in this beautiful yellow, this blue. This blue is gorgeous right here. Beautiful colors. We also have them in basket form. I mean, there's just different, different ways and different um, looks for all the variety of people that we have that come in here. This is all Roman Reyes's work here. Hi, we're going to go over to the studio, but before we get to the studio, we're going down, we call this our alleyway, and we also have paintings in here. So you're going to see paintings of Andres, of Elizabeth Toledo, and, um, and some other works that are, this is Fabio, again, it's Pearson, which is just fabulous, and this is um, Adriana Martinez. I want to take you over to the studio, and this is where most of the artists, most of our uh, artists from Alag work. Cora is working on a, this is a self-portrait, and um, as you can see, and it's very interesting. She used some of her props or things that she sees here that she has here at a lot. So when I tell you that we, when we paint, when we work, we're painting whatever is in our soul and what is in our heart at the moment. We have um, many, many things that go on here. A lot of planning, a lot of um, talks, and, and it just goes on and on. I would really, really like everybody to come by and visit us. Again, ALAC is the community's gallery. It is a nonprofit organization, and we love to have you here.